So some of you know and some of you don't know that there is a fifth season of the year, and that season is the college application season. <laughs> We are in it right now. And I have a friend who's a college admissions advisor at a very competitive high school, not so far from where we are standing right now today. And she said that at this season of the year, she kind of feels like she has a red phone at the White House because she calls parents and they call her back within seconds. <laughs> So she called one family and the father called her back right away. And she said she heard a funny noise in the background of the phone call and she asked him what it was. And he said, don't worry, it's not a problem, I can talk to you, I'm just doing a colonoscopy. <laughs> You're too easy. <laughs> so she said she felt a little creepy. She would rather not talk to him right then. But it's, it's an example of what's going on. Those of you who send your children to summer camp, do you know about bunk1.com? How many? Yeah. So bunk1.com, this is this website that posts pictures of children having fun at camp. And, <laughs> It's very password protected, so the wrong people can't see it. But the camp directors have found that it's a mixed blessing because it's a nice revenue stream for the camp. The parents buy the pictures. But the dark side of bunk1.com are the phone calls that the camp directors get from the parents, like, I was looking at bunk1.com and I saw a picture of Alicia. It was posted on July 18th. It's picture 23B, you can look at it yourself. <laughs> and frankly, we have received two postcards from Alicia telling us she's having a wonderful time at camp. However, when we looked at this picture online, we noticed that Alicia was walking slightly behind some other girls. <laughs> and those girls were, they looked like they were laughing and joking together. They were all smiling. Alicia, she was not. <laughs> so I would be very grateful if you could look into this and see kind of way the fact and fiction here of Alicia's level of happiness. Another bunk1.com call was from a father who I suspect was put up to this by the mother. And he said, um, we've been looking at pictures of Jason, and he's wearing the same shirt in every picture. <laughs> so this makes us wonder if he is wearing the same underwear every day. <laughs> this is what I call good parents gone bad. <laughs> loving, devoted, intelligent parents. In fact, the more loving, devoted, and intelligent parents are, the more this stuff happens. And one of the reasons, I, I'll tell you this part. I used to, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and I used to do psychological testing of kids. I don't do that anymore. I actually don't see children anymore because I'm too old and tired. So I, I ask the parents to bring me photos of the kids. That's all I can handle. And they used to bring me nice pictures that I could put in my file. Now they hand me their iPhone. So I know what to do. I look at the pictures. And, I, I would tell parents, I, after I did psychological testing, I would tell parents that there was nothing wrong with their child and they were totally crushed. <laughs> and I started to think on the west side of Los Angeles, in the eyes of their parents, every child was learning disabled, gifted, or both. <laughs> the normal curve had died. 
and I thought about phrases that we never hear any longer, ever. And they, I, some people in the audience, a few may be old enough to remember these phrases. They're, they are very respectful and loving towards children. Phrases like late bloomer, slow developer, going through a phase. Children actually in the past had the luxury of going through one phase and then another phase after that. And even the phrase, I was thinking about this the other day, juvenile delinquent, which it sounds really bad, but if you take it apart, juvenile is young, delinquent is just a little bit slow, it has hope in it. They still, they could get someplace. So why are we so crazy? We're so crazy for two reasons. One is that we have a 24-hour news cycle, and the news cycle is a hungry beast. It needs to present very low probability but highly sensational events to sell its products to the advertisers. So a middle-class child gets abducted from their middle-class home, and every family in America knows about it for two seconds, and they don't let their 12-year-old walk down the block to visit their friend who lives on the corner. We have, there's a piece of pornography called the U.S. News and World Report Rankings of Schools and Colleges that I never want you to look at because it gives you the impression that there are only 10 colleges for every single Jewish high school senior in the country to go to. 10. There are 20. Also, the media loves to create the idea that all the high school kids are really, really skanky. And so we look at what happened to Miley Cyrus. We get so nervous. I was talking to a bar mitzvah, bar, bar and bat mitzvah caterer, b'nai mitzvah caterer, and he said that the parents don't want him to use long tablecloths on the tables. So this is true. I, I could not make these things up because... There was a fear that the 13-year-olds would be climbing under the tables to have oral sex. Not so lucky. Now, they're not, they're not doing that yet. But the media loves this stuff. I love The Onion. So people know TheOnion.com. It's a, it's a website, and they have fake news headlines. And two of my favorite ones recently, The Onion... The Onion really is almost as good as Lexapro. So if, <laughs> if you need to take Lexapro, keep taking it, but you could look at The Onion from time to time for a little extra drop of joy. <laughs> onion headlines. Could your child suddenly drop dead for no reason? <laughs> Mother's anxiety soothed by anxious phone call from son. And then my favorite one recently is more colleges offering dick around abroad programs. <laughs> Barcelona. The parents haven't even been to Barcelona yet. Another reason that we feel so anxious about our children is that we have very serious things to be worried about. It appears that our planet is melting <laughs> and that we do not know if there will be a planet left for our children or, or grandchildren, and we feel very anxious about this. The economy is very unstable. We don't know if our children will be able to have the style of living that we have raised them in. These are genuine and serious concerns. So what do we do with these concerns? We narrow our focus from all of the things we have no control over to the one thing we do believe we have some control over, and that's whether our second grader gets the good or the better second grade teacher. <laughs> And we know we're not allowed to request teachers, so we speak in a secret code. <laughs> and the code goes like this. Given Joshi's learning style, <laughs> and 
Given Mrs. Blumberg's teaching style, I was kind of thinking that Joshi would do better in the other second grade. But while you're dividing up the classes, Trevor and Henry, they would do great with Mrs. Blumberg. So you could put them there and make sure that Joshi has Miss Honey for his teacher. <laughs> Again, and this is something. I, I actually have been noticing in my practice recently, it's sort of stunning to me, that um, kids are actually not even concentrating too hard on when they need to go to the bathroom. So, no, they've handed the responsibility over to their parents, and I hear, these are young kids. I hear parents saying stuff like to their children like, well, it's Wednesday, and I know the last time you went was Monday. So they, I know, it's so weird. It, it, this is called the gastrocolic reflux, reflex. And um, the kids have sort of handed the responsibility over for bowel function, for homework, and for rejection from birthday parties over to their parents. And the parents take it all over for them. And then they get to college, and the college deans have nicknames for them. They call them teacups and crispies. The teacups are the kids who have been so protected by their handlers from birth that they get to college and they don't know how to operate on their own. They don't know what to do if they have a difficult roommate. They don't know how to ma manage their work cycle, their homework, their sleep cycle, their eating on their own. They get to the salad bar and they are calling mom at home. They say, mom, 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 do I like Russian dressing? <laughs> which is something I would like them to figure out before they go to college, or they could take a big, big risk and make a mistake, and they could do it all on their own. Parents have become sort of like a cross between a butler, a Sherpa, a concierge, the secret police, a talent agent, and the ATM. And the parents are very crabby about this. They don't like it, but they don't know any other way. The Crispies are so burned out from the homework load that they have been carrying since pre-K. And we see these little boys in pre-K. that work is so hard for them. They don't know how to keep their bottom in the chair. They don't know how to sit still all day without making fart noises. <laughs> They don't know how to do the stuff the girls know how to do, like say, oh, Ms. Blumberg, is that a new haircut I see? Where did you get those bracelets? I love them. The boys don't know how to do that, and so we red shirt them. We, they're in uh, first grade, they're nine years old, these boys. So old. So those are the Crispies. Such a heavy homework load all through high school. They get to college kind of burned out cases. The college uh, admissions people or the college deans call them days survivors of some bewildering lifelong boot camp. Days survivors of some bewildering lifelong boot camp. But there is something we can do about this. And one of the things we can do is to not let our imagination and our intelligence combine to create paranoia. I was born to two Jewish parents. I had no religious education of any kind when I was growing up. And I used to describe myself the way John Stewart describes himself, which is Jew-ish. That's what he says about himself. He said it on TV. He says, I'm Jew-ish. So I was Jewish. My whole Jewish everything when I was growing up took five hours a year. I counted it. It was the Passover Seder and the lighting of the Hanukkah candles. My father's job was that he was the publisher of the National Lampoon. So we were like too we, yeah we were too cool for sure. We did we do that. <laughs> And when my now 24-year-old daughter was three, we were invited to Leo Beck Temple by a friend of ours to go to the little kid high holiday service. And I really went with the spirit of a cultural anthropologist. I would see how the Jews of West Los Angeles celebrate an ancient holy ritual. 
And it was really sweet. There was a woman rabbi. I didn't know. Sue Elwell. I didn't know there was such a thing as a woman rabbi. And the cantor stood really close to the front row of seats. And it was incredibly sweet. And I found myself in tears. And I am not an easy cry at all. So I thought that maybe I was so happy to be a mom. It had taken me a long time to have my first child. I had a number of miscarriages before I had my baby. And so I thought, I'm just so happy to be here with all these other parents. And I went back on Yom Kippur again to the little tot, tot Shabbat Yom Kippur service. And I was in tears again. And the very, very short version of my Jewish journey is that I left my practice entirely to study Judaism full time. And the reason I did this is that I found in traditional Jewish teachings amazingly profound wisdom for raising children at this moment in history. And none of this could be found in psychology books. One of the first things I learned was from the Babylonian Talmud. And the teaching is that every parent has an obligation to teach their child how to swim. So I um, went back to my practice and I taught a class for many years called Homework, Food, Sex, Death, and the Holy, Using Jewish Teachings to Raise Self-Reliant Children. And in teaching this class, the parents of the kids kept getting older, and my kids kept getting older, and soon my children were teenagers. And the reason it took me 10 years between writing The Blessing of a Skin Knee and The Blessing of a B Minus coming out was that that book was hard to write. <laughs> and when, there was a path from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land that would have taken 40 days. Does anybody know this teaching? That it, it, Moses could have led the people from Egypt to the Promised Land in 40 days, and he chose a route that took 40 years. And this was because of his recognition that the people were not ready for freedom too quickly. This journey across the desert is often spoken of as the adolescence of the Jewish people. And I recently counted, I just did this for fun, I counted the number of times the word grumbled is used in the book of Exodus. So the people, it, grumbling constantly, grumbled against Moses, grumbled against the Lord, quarreled with Moses, just quarreled. And this is my favorite quote. This is Exodus 14, 11, because it just shows how sarcastic people are when they are traveling from their youth through their adolescence to maturity. The people said to Moses, was it for want of graves in Egypt that you took us to this miserable, horrible place? <laughs> Moses goes to Mount Sinai to get the goddamn Ten Commandments. He's gone a few minutes longer than the people think. What do they do? They turn to Moses' sometimes really admirable, sometimes kind of slacker brother Aaron, and they say, we have nothing to worship. We need something fast. So this is what Aaron says to the people. This is Exodus 32 too. He says, take off, and listen closely to the wording, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. So obviously the boys were wearing earrings. And let's build a golden calf. So they build a golden calf. They have a giant toga party. <laughs> the manna is coming down from heaven. Moses says to the people, just take the amount you need for each day. And on the Sabbath, you will be provided for. What do they do? They take a double portion. Before the Sabbath, it turns rancid and there are maggots. Think about a teenager's room. What's in there? <laughs> Rotting food just in case. So little kids, little kids, incredibly sweet. They're so dear. They're hard. They're not so cooperative. But they say stuff. They love you. They say stuff to you like, you are the bestest mommy in the whole wide world. They think you're beautiful. 
They say, lie down in bed with me until I fall asleep. They want you to touch them. They want to cuddle with you. And then they turn seven. So adolescence now starts at seven. It lasts from seven to 29. Here's why. This is science. This is not my opinion. Seven, for two reasons. Disney Channel, where they learn all that smart and sassy talk. And because puberty comes earlier now than it ever has in human history. The American Pediatric Association has changed the, different, the definition of precocious puberty, which means pathologically early puberty, because it is normal for girls to be entering puberty at seven, eight, or nine. They're not menstruating yet. But they're getting that, that comes in another two or three years, they're getting that hormone bath of the brain that leads them to look at you with so much disgust, disdain, <laughs> and scorn. They put a sign on their door, and a friend of mine called me recently, she was so heartbroken, her seven-year-old put a sign on the door, it said, please knock, N-O-C-K. Please knock. This means you get out. <laughs> this was the person who said, lie down with me fall till I fall asleep. You're the bestest mommy in the whole wide world. When I grow up, can I marry you and daddy and live right next door? <laughs> and now they say, get out. <laughs> they say stuff, they're geniuses. They know you better than your therapist ever did or will. <laughs> they, say, they say stuff like, mom. You have a lot of personal problems. <laughs> and everyone we know knows this about you, Mom. And they talk about it all the time. I hear them. They are geniuses. If you take it personally, you're dead. So. The reason that this trip across the desert needed to take 40 years is that God and Moses, in collusion, recognized that the people would not be ready for freedom too quickly. The land of milk and honey has its equivalent in the land of college beer pong and hookups. <laughs> So you know about this hookups and the walk of shame? The walk of shame. So that's, you know, the girl, she's just, she's lonely and homesick. So she spends the night with this boy she doesn't care a hoot about. And then in the morning, she walks back to her dorm with her makeup kind of running and her party clothes and her heels. It's all so humiliating. In part, this is because they are going to college sophisticated but immature. And they are immature because we treat them like handicapped royalty. We treat children who are perfectly capable of making good decisions as though they can't make any decisions at all. We rush in like Vikings to solve all their problems. And this does not lead them to know how to trust their own decisions. They need to make cheap mistakes while they're young, Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. They also are, they suffer from entitlement and anxiety. And this is the most common symptom we see in the consulting room with adolescents. Entitlement and anxiety, as though everything should come very easily to them, and if it doesn't, they get very, very nervous. So one thing we don't want to do is make... Um, little pious speeches to them instead of saying no. So I hear parents saying things like, and this is because the kids are such, so brilliant and they're so good at arguing. So a mom might say something like, oh, Shira, honey, sweetie, love. <laughs> Don't you think those jeans ride a little bit low on your hips? Honey, sweetie, love, love. As though Shira would then say, Gee, Mom, I think you're right. <laughs> but 
But until you brought this to my attention, I hadn't realized it. <laughs> Mom, if you don't mind if I interrupt this incredibly elucidating conversation, I'd like to run upstairs and change into the jumper that Bubby gave me for Hanukkah. <laughs> And speaking of Bubby, I can't remember what it was. Is it bursitis? I know something was causing her some kind of pain, Mom. So I, what I'd like to do is put in a quick call to Bubby after I change into that jumper, check on her health, have a little chat, come downstairs, and maybe we could make some tofu no-egg sandwiches on whole wheat bread, pour a little apple juice, surprise the whole family with a healthy lunch. No girl ever said that. <laughs> no girl ever will. So I want kids to be bored, unhappy, disappointed, rejected, angry, confused, feel deprived, believe it's a tragedy of earth-shattering proportion that they've been born into the wrong family. <laughs> I want high schoolers to experience heartbreak. I want kids to be cold and wet and hungry for more one, than one and a half seconds before they graduate from high school. I want your middle school aged daughter to have a shallow, domineering, slutty best friend. <laughs> Freud said that the goal of psychoanalysis was the conversion of neurotic misery into ordinary unhappiness. <laughs> so I will wrap up so we can get to our questions, but a very, very quickie 12-step program called Parents Anonymous. We all need to join and recognize that we are powerless over overprotection, over facilitating, over scheduling, over indulgence, Ex the expectation that kids should be good at everything. It's a beautiful Hasidic teaching. It says, if your child has a talent to be a baker, do not ask this child to be a doctor. We can kind of think of them as seeds that came in a packet without a label. We don't know what season they're going to bloom. We don't know what kind of flower we're going to get, but our job is just to pull the really big weeds and stand back and wait to see whom God has given us. So, thank you. Thank you. One last thing, I want them to do chores. I do, they don't do any chores. They, do, they don't even wipe their own bottoms. It's just remarkable. They say four magic words, I have a test. They do. They do. And we worship at the altar of their achievements. The high priest took the ashes out of the holy temple after the sacrifices. Your child can clear the table. God is in the details. Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kot said, if you truly wish your daughter to study Torah, you can bet he didn't say your daughter, but I take the liberty of changing it. <laughs> study it yourself in her presence. She will follow your example. Otherwise, she will not herself study Torah. She will simply instruct her children to do so. <laughs> and finally, the Torah of John Lee Hooker, the great blues man, who in his song, Boogie Chillin', said, one night I was lying down. I heard Mama and Papa talking. I heard Papa say to Mama, let that boy boogie woogie, because it's in him and it's got to come out. Thank you. Okay, so my first question is, let's start with the B minus. There are B minuses that are, are hard earned B minuses. And there are B minuses that are lazy B minuses. And I think as a parent, you usually know the difference. But sometimes if you're pulling back, you don't. And I wondered if you have some uh, clues for us on that and how, to, how much to push. 
So after Amy Chua's book, The Battle Hem of the Tiger Mother, came out, I got a lot of questions about, are you sure that was a good title for your book? Do you wish you could change it? One of the reasons it's hard to size up the B minus is that the attorney for the B minus is right there with a report card. Yes. And they say things like, you, everyone knows. I, I have that here. Everyone else flunked the test too, Mom. <laughs> and everyone knows that this teacher hates boys. <laughs> She's not a good teacher. This is not my subject. So they have lots and lots of reasons. And they're geniuses. So it's really hard. What you want to do, and we focus so narrowly on grades, we sort of think of grades as the entire measure of the whole family. So it starts with APGARs. <laughs> and, oh. Yesterday, I was in Kentucky. I was speaking in Louisville, and there was a person um, involved with the school where I was speaking who told me he fought the pediatrician over the APGAR to get it raised from a 9 to a 10. Oh, wow. So that's how it starts. And this, how do we measure ourselves? Yeah. How, can we really measure our children's character? Very hard to measure a teenager's character. They seem to have such terrible characters. <laughs> But what we do is we take a snapshot of our child's life and we imagine it the epic movie. So that B minus can be terrifying. I, what I always recommend for parents do is to put it into the context of this whole person. So how respectful is this person to their grandparents? How engaged is this person in, in other things outside of school? How much time is this person wasting with a screen in front of her face? Mm -hmm. And to look at the big picture, we see that B minus and we panic. And then it becomes a sort of sibling rivalry because the child says, I did the best I could. And then the parent says, okay, no, I'm taking away your cell phone. I'm taking away your computer. I'm grounding you for 17 years. And the child says, I don't care. Go ahead. And it, get, it gets into a very low-level argument. So you mentioned Amy Choa, um, Chua. And, and actually, I think that uh, I, I read her book in preparation for this, and, and, and every page turn, you could, it's, it was like watching a train wreck. You couldn't stop reading it because it was so amazing, and at the same time, pretty horrifying. Um, I, 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 I think that she is, might inspire a certain amount of anxiety amongst us all because her children did so well while she was a helicopter parent. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that. I mean, her philosophy actually is to push your children so hard that they do better than they would have done otherwise, and they get the glory and the good feelings from having succeeded. With the, and there's a little bit of logic, and it's related to the B minus question in a way. There's a little logic to it, but at the same time, uh, well, anyway, I'll let you talk. <laughs> so it, for, does everybody know about this book? Yeah. The, the most stunning detail uh, in the book are the tooth marks on the keys of the piano because the children were so frustrated they were literally gnawing at their tormentor, the piano. The part, one of the reasons that the book is so popular is her amazing candor because a lot of parents feel the way she does and some do what she does. And there was an editorial in, in the Jewish press saying how Jewish parents do the same thing but differently, that we do it in a kind of passive-aggressive way. <laughs> so we'll say stuff like, don't you think this would be a good time to be working on those flashcards? Here they are. <laughs> like sweeter, but the same kind of message. I think that the, the issue I agree with her about very much is that only hard work produces satisfaction and that we praise our children too much. We say, oh my God, look, she breathed in. <laughs> then she breathed out. 
they play the part of a bush in the Hanukkah pageant, of a dreidel, and they get a whole bouquet of roses. Yeah. So we're, we're so we're just applauding them every second, and this actually makes it hard for them to try new things. This is sort of the paradox of giftedness. Kids who are really gifted, it's very hard for them to not be perfect. So there's some very good message in there. It's such a page turner. It's like looking at watching a horror movie. Yeah, yeah. But we live in Hollywood, and there's a lot of examples of of, of sort of very talented children out there with you know agents and pushy moms, and yet look at them, Miley Cyrus or whatever. And then, of course, there's the bad side to their lives as well. But it's sort of hard to resist some of those models. Do you do you counsel people against that? Do you say wait until they're grown before they exercise their talent as an art, as an artist or as an uh, an actor or whatever? What's your feeling on that? And I will often ask parents who it's for mm -hmm. because it is a very unsettled world and we are so anxious. And parents look at their lives raising children and it's less exciting than it was before. Mm -hmm. So this vicarious delight in children's achievement is very seductive. Mm -hmm. What we see in kids who have been pushed too hard, and this is particularly true in girls, boy, Leviticus 19.14 says, do not put a stumbling block before the blind. We put a stumbling block before the blind for boys in early elementary school because they just, they can't master that curriculum, a lot of them, and they're just too rowdy, so we drug them into sitting still. But the girls, <laughs> middle school and high school, the degree of perfectionism in girls who believe they need to be Perfect, mm -hmm. and in it, in all the traditional girl areas, they need to be exceedingly slender and popular and nice. And they look at pictures in magazines; not a single picture is of a real life human woman. They're all airbrushed and photoshopped, and so they think they need to be perfect in that way, and that they also need to take AP Physics and Calculus before they graduate from high school and solve the problem of hunger in Rwanda and attend a couple of summit meetings. And when I talk to these girls, it's really, it's actually heartbreaking what they say in the consulting room. They say, because the girls are a combination of really narcissistic and dramatic about themselves and deeply attuned to what's going on at home. So they say, I'm afraid if I get a grade below A on a quiz, not even a test, that my parents will get divorced. I'm afraid that my mother will be depressed. And these are these girls injure themselves. Do people know about this, self-injury in girls? And some of these girls, they're not clinically depressed. They're absolutely not suicidal. They don't know any way to express anger, frustration, and pressure except by taking it out on themselves. Which is why I want kids to follow their own doofy, ragged path with changing interests, changing passions, going through lots and lots of phases. In your book, you talk about the Yetzirah, which I've always thought of as sort of the negative side of ourselves, the kind of dark side that we're supposed to work against to get to the good side. But, but you actually see it in the book, as I understand it, as, as a, um, an opportunity to explore to find where you can take those other sides of yourself and, and, and bring them out. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. So the Yetzirah is the evil inclination. And the rabbis say without the evil inclination, there would be no cities built, no marriages, no curiosity, no passion, and no spark. And they say the Yetzirah is tov meod, is very, very good, but it needs to be channeled. So when I work with parents, I say to them, tell me your child's worst trait. So with teenagers, they will often say, and the te you know some of the teenagers are four-year-old girls. <laughs> now I'm I'm working with some families, four-year-old girls, and the mothers say she's so mean to me. She's such a bitch. <laughs> so then I say about so this is the answer how it's told me. She has a lot of conviction. She's not afraid to speak her mind. She is forthright. The lazy teenager knows how to chill out. Do we? Not so well. 
They play their music so loudly, and we think they have no empathy. What kind of family citizens are these? They play their music so loudly because they love it so much. They're so upset about what happens with their friends because they care about their friends so much. So all of these traits, you can, psychologists call this reframing. You can reframe the Yetzer Hara as the absolutely most exciting, intense, passionate part of your child. We have such a narrow path for these kids. They're all supposed to be gregarious. Some of them are shy. They do not have social anxiety disorder. They are shy. <laughs> Some of them have a big temper. They don't have, I even forget what it's called now. What's it called, the kids who have a bad temper? They have... No, it has a fancier name. The oppositional defiant disorder, thank you. <laughs> oppositional defiant, no, it's not a disorder. It's just the Yetzer Harab moving into the Yetzer Tov. So, some of them are incredibly sweet with little kids. Some of them are uh, poets. They have a very slow pace because they catch sight of a moat of dust coming down <laughs> through the light and they have to write a little song about it right then. <laughs> but it's time to get ready for the carpool and they have to hurry up. And after school, they have to go to 17 after school activities and then come home and do seven hours of homework. And we diagnose them, and we think that there's something wrong with them. They're just being children. And teenagers are just being teenagers, and it can seem like a really ugly business, but it's a three-ring circus. It's so invigorating. If you can just relax <laughs> and be alert but not so alarmed. You write about sleep um, and about eating some. And, and, and so, so, so some of us have children who decide to become vegetarians, for example, and we're not, or, or whatever. I mean, how much should you make special meals for your child, or how much should you go in and say, it's time to go to bed when they're 14, 15 years old? So um, that's why I called that class homework, sex, death, food, I should have put in sleep and the holy. Um, teenagers are not getting enough sleep. They, they're growing, and they're growing fast. You know, it's so amazing. Like, one day, they have a really long neck. <laughs> they do. It's hard to go to school. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> and then they come home, and they're really rude. It's exactly the same as the preschool meltdowns. Yeah. They, like, hold it together all day to go to preschool. They come home, and they have a tantrum. And that's what middle schoolers do. Middle school is very, very hard, socially and academically and emotionally. So they come home and they act horrible towards you. And then they're dying for some privacy. So they make their room so messy that there's not even a pat. There's no place for you to sit. And it smells bad. And the dirty clothes are mixed with the clean clothes. So um, they're not getting enough sleep. They need nine hours of sleep, some of them more. A lot of them get six. So they come to my office. The parents say, I'm sure this child has attention deficit disorder or a learning issue. They have sleep deprivation, and so do the parents. We're also crabby and tired. So a lot of times with teenagers, I want all the electronics out of their room at bedtime. And, you know, they say their lawyerly stuff. I'm just finishing up my homework. I'm not G-chatting. I'm just doing my homework with my friends. Um, so they, they just talk a lot of nonsense. And it's, it can be very good to get everything out of their rooms. Now, some of them manage fine. And they are getting enough sleep, but a lot of them are sleep deprived. The food fad stuff, just Go with it. We have our own food fads. So a lot of families have like no sugar or no products that have bisphenol A, the breakdown <laughs> products from plastics. Don't put that plastic in the microwave. So we're, we're hysterical. They're hysterical. If you relax about it, it tends to go away. A lot of the vegetarianism goes away. Sometimes it stays and it's noble and impressive. Right. 
but they can also prepare their own food. I see kids who've never used a knife. <laughs> they have no fun danger. I love Shabbat. Shabbat is the most countercultural thing that ever happened. So, but little kids can use a fireplace match and light the Shabbat candles. They don't get to play with fire. They don't get to use sharp objects. They don't get to climb trees. This is off the subject, but I have to quickly tell this. So I have one of my daughters is teaching preschool at Wilshire Boulevard Temple. And um, she told me a story, not about the temple, but about a preschool trend in the nation that was so remarkable to me. This is the red washcloths. Do people know about this? OK, some do. Red In preschools, they they um, store red washcloths in the supply closet. So if one of the preschoolers gets a bloody nose or a skin knee, the teacher can quickly grab the red washcloth so the child will not be frightened by the sight of their own blood. <laughs> Children love blood. <laughs> it's the most brightly colored thing that comes out of the human body. If they don't get to experience blood, they won't learn about clotting. So I want them to do all kinds of dangerous stuff, but not for we are not short order cooks. This is the dinner. Eat it or don't eat it. You can prepare some food for yourself or you can eat again tomorrow morning. Be easy with the food fads. They do, they do tend to come and go. It's the same with the hair color, the bizarre way they dress. When are they going to get to do that again? They're going to be in business school. They won't get to do that there. So let's go back to the B minus. And, and let's say it's a B minus where, where, you know, in math, and they're really good at math. Or if it's, I'm not talking about a class where it's, it really is hard. But should there be consequences for that? Or should you just let them be and have the consequences come from the school and the peers or whatever? I mean, or let's say it's, um, uh, I like this one, I can tell. Yeah, I was saving it for later, but I'm going to do, do it, it now. Do it now. Yeah. OK, so you pick your kid up from a party, and you can smell the alcohol. Mm. I'm going to let you go from there. <laughs> OK, so our first reaction is generally to panic and to scare scapegoat, and we're kind of scapegoating our own child, this B minus, you have betrayed us as a family. <laughs> this alcohol on your breath, this is the road to ruin. So the first thing, and with um, little kids, what I like to do when they have done something that violates the family rules or gotten themselves in trouble, with little kids I like to say, wow. And with teenagers, I, I, I change it to, whoa. <laughs> it's a little different flavor. Whoa. Four B minuses here. What do you think's going on? You say to them, talk to me about this. How do you feel about it? Now, a lot of times they'll say, great, I feel great. But they, they don't. It's their job to do their work to the best of their ability. They don't milk the cows. I wish they did milk the cows. But one of the things that they do is their schoolwork. And they can kind of wreck their lives if they don't apply themselves. It's not cute, and it's not funny. It's serious business. And the alcohol on the breath. We're, we walk on eggshells with these kids because we're so worried about their self-esteem. I don't want to humiliate her or say anything that might be wrong. You could say, I smell alcohol on your breath. Yeah. And they, many times what happens is they clam up right in the moment, but they'll talk to you. Because you allowed that child to go to that party. And there was probably not enough adult supervision there. Mm -hmm. Now, and generally, they do some drinking in high school. Juniors and seniors do some drinking at parties. When seventh graders have alcohol on their breath, you have a, a different story. So there's experimentation and learning. And this is all the same as teaching your child how to drive. In Southern California, we have to teach them how to drive on the freeway. It is the most frightening thing that will ever happen in your life. 
the kids are also a little faster socially than they are at, in some other areas in the country, and you want to talk to them about the consequences of poor choices. We can also say no. You can say, I am not ready for that about the next party that the child gives where they came home with the alcohol on their breath. And you could say, I'm sure you'll be fine. You say, I'm not ready. You also talk about having some of these experiences before, before yes. college. Right. Um, and I take that to heart because I have heard stories of kids getting to college where they're not, they're not equipped to, to deal with these kinds of situations. So where's the balance? Once they get to college, there is no one looking after them but the 19-year-old resident advisor on the dorm. So I want them actually to experience, if not their friends, then their own hangover once. To realize, uh, to learn a little bit about cause and effect. And this is subtle and tricky, and it depends on the child. Some kids are so unready. And some kids use drinking as a shortcut tool. And this is what they can do in college. You can make every single bad feeling go away in college with beer pong and hookups. Mm -hmm. You can. You make loneliness go away, sadness, fear, social anxiety. It's instantly gone. And you pay a big price. You pay a price in your dignity, in your grades, in your reputation. Mm -hmm. So this is the cause and effect of high school. What are the goals seems to be to... In get them to internalize a message. I mean, it's true for whether we're conscious of it or not. So I'm thinking that to be a good parent means to actually choose which message you want them to internalize. You write about that. You have a list of things, uh, how you act in the carpool line, for example. I just wondered. Carpool line has rules, right? There are rules about how to behave with your car in the carpool lane. And some people collect signed baseballs or Limoges porcelain. I collect, this is true, carpool lane violation letters written by principals and heads of schools because the parents don't follow the carpool rule. So you want your children to follow rules at home, but you're not following the carpool lane drop off and pick up rules. The synagogue parking lot, for example, may say no left turn. And then you say to yourself, but it just Today, Shira has an orthodontist appointment, just today. <laughs> then we pick them up at school and we interview them for pain. We sit, we're on cell phone. It's a holy moment, the reunion of two souls, get off the cell phone. But the next thing we do is we say, how was your day, honey? How does your tummy feel like on a scale of one to four compared to the way it felt this morning, a little better, a little worse? How did your math test go? Is your teacher getting your learning style any better? <laughs> so, or still right over your head. And, and uh, how was lunch? Did those girls, those girls who were your best friends since preschool, whose moms were my best friends, <laughs> those bitches, Did they sit with you or did you sit all alone again? <laughs> so instead, and this is the whole idea of the best way to influence kids, especially teenagers, is by your example. They don't listen to anything you say and they watch you like hawks. They watch you all the time. They watch if you condone cheating in school. They watch if you tell lies. They watch if you gossip about other adults. Lashon hara, it's a huge principle in Judaism because the rabbis recognize that all we want to do is gossip about other people. And we live in this whole celebrity gossip world. So if we speak well of other adults in front of our teenagers, if you pick your kid up in the carpool and you talk to them about something in your day, that moved you, something you saw that was beautiful, something somebody in your office did for somebody else or on a committee that you serve on that you found to be admirable, something that reminded you of your child, 
they will tell you about their day instead of this interviewing for pain mm. where we communicate to the children that their mood and their grades are the only things we care about. So let's go back to, the, uh, to, to that ride, ride in the car when you pick them up from a party and you can tell something, somebody was drinking or smoking pot or whatever it might be. What, 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 what should be the first words out of your mouth when, when you are confronting an issue that you're, you know is not, the, not a good one? How would, you, how would you phrase it to the child? So there's a, there's a really great 12-step phrase. Um, it's an acronym, WAIT, W-A-I-T, and it stands for, why am I talking? <laughs> we are so quick to lecture kids, and it makes them parent deaf. So what you can do instead is make a statement and then wait. So you could say, for example, I smell alcohol on your breath mm -hmm. and wait. If you say it not in, and, and you can say, and I'm concerned, Tell, talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, if you say, clearly you are headed for jail, honey. <laughs> You know what happened to Uncle Mark. That's in your genes. You know, we say, we get crazy because we're so devoted. So less is more. Mm -hmm. And another thing we have an ambition to do is solve it all right then. Mm -hmm. Because we're so nervous and upset, we want to get it over with. So we want to have a really big talk and get it all out and tell every story from our own childhood and find out everything. We want the history from the first extra cupcake they took at a birthday party to this <laughs> drink that they had at this party. But with teenagers, it's really lots of short conversations in the car, late at night, so hard for us to stay up, but late at night, and you sort of have to be around quite a bit to catch when they're ready to talk, but very unlikely to solve it right then. It's a series of ongoing conversations where you do a lot of listening and just what you did right now with your head, such a nice thing. You just sort of, it's affirmation as you listen. So what you're saying is restate the problem in a way without, mm -hmm. without judgment. Mm -hmm. and and then listen. And usually more, you'll get more out of them. Yeah, listen, and then you can ask follow-up questions and you can say, have you ever been in a situation like this before? How did you handle it? You're empowering them to trust their good judgment from previous experiences to apply it to these experiences. For example, they may be afraid to say no to their friends. And you can talk with them about other times where they were able to say no and what happened, how it turned out. So you're using their catalog of experiences to help them now rather than your pious lecture. So you know that it's getting towards exam time and you figure that um, your kid has some homework coming up and it's like Sunday around 2 o'clock and all they want to do is go to a party or to uh, get together with friends. And you want to say to them, what about your homework? You need to stay here. How do you approach that? I like that. <laughs> and what if, okay, so what if, <laughs> what if they say, oh, I, I, I did all my homework. Okay, so this is where the B minus comes in. We're always thinking about track record, not that we tar and feather them, but that if you have a child who generally tends to be a good planner and not a procrastinator, nobody in this room has a child like that. <laughs> very, very rare beast. Um, so you look at what happened last time midterms came around, or a big paper, or finals, and you have your evidence to build your case. Yeah. And you say, tell me your plan. And you say, tell me your plan so I can leave you alone. The whole angle is, how are you going to get me off your back? 
Now, that really is your perspective. And if they make a good case based on their track record, then you get off their back. We tend to nag and worry too much, but we also have to nag and worry. That's what I'm saying. You're, in a way, you're giving us two, two Absolutely. pieces of contradictory advice that it is important to remember. And, and the, the part that it's important to remember, I said that adolescence started at 7 and ends at 29. The prefrontal cortex, this is a part of the brain responsible for executive functioning, for planning, for judgment, for delay of gratification. It does not finish developing in girls till they're 24 and boys until they're 29, which explains so much of everything. <laughs> so they need help. But what they need is a consultant and not a slave driver. Because if you make it your problem, they'll just hand it over to you. It then becomes your test and your homework. What about when you find out your kids left their form spring? Or do you know about form spring? It's one where they have to answer whatever questions asked of them. They they put themselves out there. No, uh, it's it's um, they they say form spring me, and then everybody goes on the site and they ask them direct questions. Or so your kids, strangers, find, uh, anonymous strangers. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's like chat roulette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they're tweeting or they're Facebooking, and so you're seeing them putting things out there that, that you'd rather they learn privacy. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you, how do you, I mean, you, there's a delicate balance, it seems to me, between invading into their internet life and governing it. So I wondered what you think about that and what you would say. And there's a lot of spying that goes on. So parents do a lot of stealth tracking of what their kids are doing online, but they can't let the kids know because then the kids will just get a whole new Facebook or right. move somewhere else in cyberspace. <laughs> They're pretty dopey about this. And this idea, and it literally, it's Piagetian. They don't have object permanence and object constancy. No, they don't understand that it's permanent. And they feel their own exuberance. I just want the whole world to know every form springy thing, thing about me. And I'm so expansive and you're so uptight. And you don't get it. And you don't understand what the world is like now. So again, so if Judaism can be boiled down to just three things, it's moderation, celebration, and sanctification. A moderate profile in cyberspace is what we are all aiming for. The kids generally tend to be too free, too loose, and too exuberant. Mm -hmm. To shut it down entirely is unfair and cruel because they don't get to do something we all got to do, which is to hang out on the stoop away from adults. These kids are in the prying eyes of adults all, almost all day long every day. They take so many lessons. They have a long school day. They have tutoring. Some schools, 80% of the kids are tutored. You're with a creepy adult the whole day long. So you want to bust out into cyberspace and take off your clothes, basically, just to relax a little bit. I mean, we used to get to hang out in a vacant lot. How many people here when you were growing up, could play outside on a summer night without any adult knowing where you were. And how many of you did things your parents didn't know about? <laughs> and your parents still don't. <laughs> so when do these kids get to do it? They're sort of doing it on this global platform. And we want moderation without getting too paranoid or being too naive. And again, these are depends on the individual childhood, child and the individual day. It's tough stuff. I do want people to ask questions. I'm sure you have questions, no? Okay, oh good, okay. I loved your book and I just finished it yesterday. So Thank this you. Is, at the end, you talked about something that I wondered about the whole way through, which is the truthiness concept. And what do you do when you're brilliant lawyer child says, weren't you ever drunk at a party? Or they ask you very personal questions. How do you feel about being honest with them and to what degree? Or if you can give us some actual statements of semi-honesty and semi-deflection, I could greatly use those. <laughs> 
So in the book, I talk about truthiness, meaning you, do, you don't do two things. One, we sort of take the easy way out and we say, the pot is much stronger now. <laughs> Or the cooler parents say, the weed is much stronger now. And I, I'm not even sure that's true. But that's kind of chickening out. You definitely don't need to tell them the whole story. What they want to know is, is not what they need to know. And it's sort of like Aesop's Fables are so many rabbinic stories, they're teaching tales. So you select from your history what will be helpful for that child at that moment. And kids are tricky because some of them are very articulate, but they're really young. When I said to you, some parents are better at this than others, let the parent who's better at it do the talking. <laughs> And you know how in 12-step, I'm entirely in favor of 12-step programs. I think they're very wonderful. But sometimes they kind of devolve a little bit into showing off over what you survived. So you want to be careful not to do a combination of, I was really cool too, you're not going to believe what I did, but don't do that. <laughs> Again, it depends on the child. Your younger child sometimes might be able to hear more than your older child. Or the very articulate girl needs to hear less than the kind of clammed up boy. It depends. But you mine your history for the value of what you can teach your child. Absolutely, this is not a case where full disclosure makes us a very honest, open family. In your book, you mention about college applications and not creating your child to go to a certain college, and then it almost seems like you contradict it, like the readers won't believe you when you talk about getting a job and that the interviewers from a college panel are there and they're going to look for a paid job. So I just kind of want you to respond to that a little bit about saying that we shouldn't do something because it's good for college, and then writing something that it's good to do because the college applicants will look at it. All right, this is what I say in the book, that parents of seniors are shocked when they look at the common application. Does everybody know what the common application is? So this is an application that many, many of the colleges use so that the students won't have to write individual essays for every college, but the colleges are so vain that they also add a separate little essay, like, why do you love Duke so much? <laughs> but on the college uh, common application, there's a question that shocks parents, because it says, please list paid employment, and the word paid is in bold, that you have held for the past three years, including summers. And parents are shocked, because the kids have done the fancy community service abroad programs. And the story you may be referring to is a story in the book about when I was with a group of college admissions advisors from very, very selective colleges. And there was a mother who raised her hand and she said, I, I, I just want to tell you that my daughter has been to Kenya. And in Kenya, and she actually used this word, she said, they taught the natives, a few words of English, and they laid a few feet of pipe, and they cleaned out a storage shed, and we are quite sure that this is going to be very impressive on her application. And one of the admissions advisors looked at this mother, and he said, we laugh at Africa. <laughs> And what he meant was that not a single one of them laughs at people in need and people in need of service. What he meant was that working at Baskin Robbins, where you can get repetitive stress injury of the wrist, which is very motivating for kids to study in college because they don't want a job like that when they graduate. Being a camp counselor 
the kids throw up. The kids are homesick. It's a great job being a lifeguard, even with the hole in the ozone layer, working for adults for pay. This is why it's on the common application, paid employment, where you have to please that adult, otherwise you get fired. As opposed to a fancy internship that somebody who worked in one of your parents' law firm got for you, and the whole thing they have to do with the interns is to kind of keep them entertained, that paid employment is really, really good for kids, and it's kind of lost favor. So I call parents transcript pimps sometimes. <laughs> Because we're choosing all this stuff that we think is going to look good, and what looks good is very much more ordinary. Uh, we're here because we care so much about our children, and they represent an enormous amount of potential. And as you know, um, it's easy to have tangible goals, and some are self-set by the children, and some are negotiated with their parents. But the thing that's so difficult to assess is the idea of motivation. Uh, we ascribe it to maybe sometimes laziness or distractions, but how do you get kids to realize the sense of motivation such that they want it, such that they're going to be moving in a place that helps them? That sense of motivation is less tangible for parents to fully assess and I'm wondering whether you might help us uh, give it a more tangible weight. Where does the motivation come from? I think we have a crisis of motivation in kids, and it's part of the paradox of how much we've tried to build up their self-esteem. So we are praising them all the time, and we're praising them for the outcome and not for their effort and hard work. And we are looking at the grades rather than the stretch and the application. And we are sitting with them for hours at night, helping them do their homework when if they don't complete their homework, they can take it up with the teacher. I was working with a family recently and I said, what would ha I said to the dad, what would happen if you don't spend five hours a night doing homework with your son? And he said, Ms. Hernandez will keep him in from recess. And I thought, great! <laughs> that this is how reality is such a good curriculum. Instead of what has happened where the kids believe it's their parents' pride, it's their parents' responsibility, and it's their parents' work. So process instead of product is what builds intrinsic motivation in kids. Could you say how you think that a Jewish camp experience might be um, a healing force in, in the, the struggle to raise our teenagers in the right way? Jewish camp, it's really, really a good thing to do. <laughs> this is why. The, there, it has three fantastic elements. One is the kids are away from the prying eyes of their nosy, nervous parents. <laughs> Two, the parents are free of the kids. <laughs> so you get to think of holy activities like sex again. <laughs> Stuff that you've just given up on for so long. Also, the combination of nature and spirituality, and this, I mean, this is the biology of humans. When you pray while you are smelling pine trees, when you are having a spiritual experience outdoors, it seals in the practice. It builds, and when you pray in community, this is why we require a minion. So this, these elements put together of being away from parents, fellowship with other Jewish campers, being in nature, and the melodies of the prayers are a formula more powerful than any other I know for building both a Jewish identity and a sense of Jewish joy in young people. Young people who are very stressed 
in their daily lives back home, very earnest, working very hard, very, very busy, they get the opportunity to just look at a tree frog jumping into the pond. I have um, a 10th grader, and he's involved in a lot of activities. He's also holding a weekend job, so I said, I'm very concerned, and I have been that helicopter parent. I said, Benji, if you want to drive, you're going to have to pay for car insurance. And lo and behold, he got a job at a local yogurt shop, and he works Saturdays and Sundays, and now I'm trying to get him to quit working on Sundays. Yeah. Benji, yeah. if you don't quit this, your Sunday job, then da 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 And he is doing a fine job so far with micromanaging swim team and jazz band. I personally, I just look at him, and I'm overwhelmed. When, when do you step in? Does Benji have roses in his cheeks right now? Actually, today he didn't. He looked, you know, he's tired. He's tired. I, I, the last two years of high school, he's in 10th grade, but he's a very busy boy. For the whole weekend to be the time when he has his job and to manage the jazz band and swim team, and if he's in any honors or AP classes, this guy has a very heavy load. And they kind of have, some of them, a really heroic attitude about it. I can do anything. It's superhero stuff. But what do you do when you when something has to go? You share the cost of the car insurance. Right, but, but then when he knows he likes, I've said that to him. I've already said, Benji, you know what? You will still be able to drive. I trust you. You've proven yourself. But he, he said, what else, would I, what else would I be doing? I would be sleeping too till two or three o'clock, and I think he... <laughs> Could you loan him out to everybody? <laughs> no, he's... Okay, so it, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. No, it's we, not. We it's, see, and I see kids. That. We see kids. It's too much. Who, and there's Donald Winnicott, the great psychoanalyst, talked about the manic defense against despair, and that is not the situation in your family, but it's something for you to think about, that we keep ourselves so very, very busy because we've lost our skill at relaxation and downtime. This is what Shabbat is about. That's why it's so radically countercultural that you would take 24 hours out of the week to appreciate what you've been given instead of creating anything new. So you may have a funny battle on your hands with him which is that you may have to say to him at a certain point, if those roses don't come back in his cheeks, I am requiring you to stop this because it's too much, although I admire so much your motivation and your drive. I want to leave you with one very final thought from the rabbis as we come to the end of our day together, which is that everyone should carry in their pockets two pieces of paper at all times. Many of you may know this beautiful teaching. On one piece of paper, you write, the world was created entirely and exclusively for my sake. On the other piece of paper, you write, I am nothing but dust and ashes. This is exactly the right attitude to have towards your children. They are amazing. They're extraordinary. They're off the normal curve. They're so intuitive. They're practically psychic. Their futures are unlimited. They are also very ordinary. We want them to be good family citizens, good Jewish citizens, good American citizens, good school citizens. There's a college for every one of them to go to. And if you are doing a colonoscopy or anything else that requires attention, focus on that and not on your child. Thank you.